This episode is sponsored by the Bastrop County Business Owners Association. The BCBOA is a socioeconomic group creating economic opportunities for its members. Membership is free. Join online at the bcboa.com. Welcome to episode four of The Heart of Bastrop. My uh, co-host, Mayor Connie Schneider, could not be here with us today, but we have Lisa Holcomb with the Bastrop Opera House. Thank you, Lisa, for co-hosting with me today. Absolutely. I'm glad to be here, and I'm excited to hear about our guests. Yes, we have two guests today. So we have Dave Scott with Earth Native School. Mm -hmm. So he's going to tell you about all the exciting things going on out there, and it's right here in Bastrop. Right. Right. So our second guest, we have Cherry K. Abel with Visit Bastrop. So I'm really interested. Cherry is new to the area, um, not to the area maybe, but to Visit Bastrop. So I'm interested about uh, learning all about her as I'm sure our guests are as well. Absolutely. It's going to be a great episode. So we're with Dave Scott with Earth Native School. Welcome. We appreciate you being a guest today. So can you tell everybody a little bit about what Earth Native School is? Yeah. How they can find out some information and those sort of things. Yeah. Well, we're a wilderness and outdoor education school. Uh, we run programs for all ages. So everything from really intensive adult survival skill courses to uh, kids, nature connection and outdoor courses. We have, um, you know, weekend classes, eight month intensives for adults. And for kids, everything from one day a week, once a month, twice a month, to even a, a outdoor forest preschool. So that's like an all outdoor preschool for uh, kids to connect with nature from a really young age. Wow, that, that sounds really, really interesting. So before we go in, because we're going to ask you a million questions. So before <laughs> we go into that, you have an interesting past. So can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, I grew up, um, well, I grew up kind of splitting my time between Austin and um, Southern Colorado and my family got really into involved in search and rescue in Southern mm -hmm. Colorado when I was just a little kid and so I spent a lot of time around search and rescue teams growing up and eventually became a member of the search and rescue team but I think that that was really influential in my childhood to see um, to see people in in situations that they couldn't um, basically they couldn't take care of themselves in the outdoors and being on the other side of that and helping to rescue people in the outdoors so um, that combined with the love of like hunting and fishing and outdoor skills as a kid, um, I think that's what ended up getting me into becoming a wilderness skills teacher and helping people to become more prepared in the outdoors, but also just to learn skills that make their outdoor experiences that much more fun. So you mentioned <clears throat> something about when you were 15, you yeah. took part in a search and rescue. Yeah. And I'm sure that had a big impact on you as yeah. you know, at that young age. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I took, I took part in a lot of searches. I think from the time I was about eight, I, I got to just tag along with my dad and my uncle. Um, my uncle was the president of the search and rescue for my whole childhood. So um, I, I got special treatment, I guess, myself and my brother. And we got to um, hang around base camp when we were little kids and or just be in our dad's truck. You know, I remember just in the middle of the night, you know, we'd be in the truck. We'd get a call at like two o'clock in the morning that someone was injured or lost in the back country. And, and um, you know, we, we, my dad was really good at having us have all these. We'd have our own little missions. So if we get like paged in the middle of the night, it's like my brother had to go get the search and rescue packs. And I had to go do this and get everything in the truck and head out. And... Um, and so, yeah, so when, when I was a teenager, I kind of got adopted more into the team in a more active role, which was pretty special because I was, you know, the only kid that got to do that. And um, I remember when I was a freshman in high school, uh, we, there was a plane crash uh, over the weekend in the mountains, and uh, we got called out for it, and we spent a few hours looking for the plane, eventually found the plane, and, um, and then, you know, my dad, I was still in the truck with my dad, and we pulled up. Um, we were going on this four wheel drive road and I didn't really, I wasn't really oriented to exactly where we were at, but it turns out we were just like a hundred yards from where the plane was at. And, um, this paramedic came up to the door and asked me if I'd come help him and, um, took me back into this plane crash and, you know, helping to give medical care to everybody. And then I went back to school, you know, I was like a freshman in high school. I went back to school and the talk of the school was that there was this plane crash in the mountains. And I remember my English teacher was like, did you guys hear about that? And I was like, well, yeah, I've heard about it. <laughs> uh, wow. So that's a, that's, that's just amazing that at such a young yeah. age to, to be involved in something like that. And, and, you know, 
I think it's, you know, I'm that person who, if you drop to me in the middle of the woods, I'd never find my way home. I can barely find I can my way help home you. with the GPS. Yeah. So, so I'm not a right, the right person. I know I've been, I'm just, I get lost. And yeah. I know a lot of people are like that. I don't yeah. have that. I always say I don't have a sense of direction I know, I don't when it believe comes that. to that. No, I, <laughs> I can get lost in my own driveway. Yeah, I, that's, me, that's, that's the joke me, with Lisa, me. Right? <laughs> definitely. And, you know, yeah. when these people are going out, and, and we have big parks here in Bastrop, mm-hmm. you know, um, I think it's important for, and I'm, I know that you agree, for people to know what to do in the event of an emergency. Totally. And find mm-hmm. yourself in that, in, in that situation because, oddly enough, my brother, um, Dan, what, when he was a kid, went camping um, in uh, the big park up toward Amarillo. I forget what it's called. Not The one that's almost like a mini Grand Canyon. Oh, um, Capra Canyon or Paladura? Paladura yeah, Canyon. Too, yeah. And they, he was with the Boy Scout troop, and he wandered off, and he spent the night alone wow. in that oh. park at eight years old, Ooh. slept on a rock to keep warm, mm. And pro- I know that they said his Boy Scout skills are one of the only things that, that saved him. And God, that's been 50, almost 60 years ago. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, even these kids, that can happen. Even when your children are out, you know, at, at a controlled thing like that, he just happened to wander off yeah. and couldn't find his way back. Mm-hmm. So, you know, those skills, the little that he learned, you know, helped him. So, um, and I know that you guys do this for children. So can you tell us a little more yeah. about what you do specifically sure. for the kids and for that yeah. situation? Well, you know, with kids, we, we don't really focus too much on like heavy topics. Like if you were to get lost and, and freak them out, but, um, you know, with adults, we do, but, um, with kids, it's really, it's really about building a, a connection to the outdoors, um, I think if, if kids are really connected to the outdoors, they're gonna much be a lot less scared in a in a you know difficult situation like that. Also, um, we we have programs rain or shine all year round um, here, and and you know like t- today it's a rainy cold day. Um, I don't know if it will be when this films, but right. um, you know it's it really character building for kids to be outside all day um, in mm. in difficult weather, mm. and I think that it teaches them what they need to equip themselves. Um, be comfortable and safe. Um, on top of that, we do teach them wilderness skills like fire making and shelter building and navigating in the woods. And a lot of the, what we teach for kids is really done in a way that is inspiration driven. So it's not like, you know, they're sitting down and they have to listen to a lecture or a class on anything. It's that we're, we're having fun in the outdoors and um, they're super into it. And then on top of that, we're just like kind of downloading a ton of wilderness skills, whether it be animal tracking, um, you know, like I said, fire, fire making, um, and, and something like fire making, it might be t- challenging to inspire a kid to take, to leave their warm living room and go outside and make a fire in the pouring rain. But if they're out at a class and it's raining and they're cold, then they'll be inspired they'll be to make like, a fire. Let's do and, it, uh, right? and it's so totally fun. And they're with other kids too. And so, um, with other kids, you know, the community builds and the sense of excitement is even greater. And so I always like liken it to, it's, it's what I think kids should be doing, and kids naturally want to do it. And then, you know, in the age of electronics nowadays, it's hard to inspire them individually to get outside. So mm-hmm. um, they, they have a ton of fun at classes. Um, they learn a lot. And, um, and, and absolutely, I think that the skills that they're learning are, are helpful to them growing into competent adults, but also people that can just take care of themselves and are hardy and tough, you know, because... Right. I think a lot of times, you know, we get we get into a difficult situation, and a lot of times, it's if you can mentally um, get through it, then you're going to be all right. And um, so that just very, comes with character. It's very hands-on. For yeah, children, right? for sure. Yeah. With adults and kids, almost all of our classes mm-hmm. are totally hands-on. We have a couple of like a little bit lectures here and there with yeah. adult classes, but right. with the kids, it's 100 percent hands-on. Right. Yeah. So let's talk about your preschoolers yeah. for a moment. <laughs> that that fascinates me that yeah. you would have children yeah. that, that yeah. young out there. So how many do you typically have in a class or a session? Yeah. Well, with the preschool, we have eight to one ratio. Mm-hmm. So there's uh, one teacher for every eight kids, and right now there's 16 kids um, in the preschool. So we run a Tuesday, thir- a Monday, Wednesday option, a Tuesday, Thursday option, and then a Friday option. And we're really close to Bastrop. We have a lot of kids. You know, we're what ten minutes away from here, uh, from downtown Bastrop. And um, we've got kids that come from Bastrop, Elgin, Page. You know, we have some that drive all the way over from Austin. But um, they start at three years old, and 
and they're just out. You know, it's amazing to me, you know, my kids went to a nature preschool in Austin, but it was kind of an urban nature preschool. And, um, you know, they had buildings and classrooms and everything. And, um, you know, it was right next to Mopac, so there was always the traffic noise. <laughs> but we're kind of just out in the woods yeah. and um, on our campus. There is a little bit of a heated building. But what, what surprises me so much when we started this preschool two years ago was that I thought on these, like, rainy, cold days in the winter that the kids would be in that preschool building, that little building, you know, kind of huddled up around the heater, but they're not, you know. I go out there, and they're just running around out there having a great time, you know, kind of dressed warmly and, and in rain rain layers, but also kind of just oblivious around the campfire mm -hmm. and just having fun. Well, and, one kid uh, did yeah. want to go play in the exactly. rain. I would yeah. go do that. That's, yeah. Totally. That almost seems like a lost art today. Yeah. You know? Absolutely. Or they're, they're, you know, kids getting a splash in the, the puddles yeah. And, yeah. and just be kids. Exactly. Um, and, you know, they get super muddy and... Um, and, and, but you know, it's so, it's so important for them to be in their senses at that age. And I, I mean, I get questions sometimes about pre preschool at three years old and whether we're going to do academic stuff. And my personal opinion is, is that kids have plenty of time to be in academics and learning Absolutely. math. It's learning about their bodies and learning about their, and, and building confidence in themselves and um, just building a hardiness, like I was talking about, that we see in kids that is not something that you can teach in a traditional school. And it's a really unique opportunity for them where they, they're really curious and inspired and um, you know, the world is kind of open and, you know, um, and still they're also free, you know, that they're not Absolutely. in kindergarten yet and first grade and all through, uh, you know, through high school. Yeah. And, you know, where kids are so busy. So they've got some free time and parents are ready for that to have a break too at that age. So oh, <laughs> send them out to us. Absolutely. <laughs> send them we'll, to the woods. we'll send them home tired <laughs> and happy. You know, when Lisa and I were young, uh, you know, we played outside all day and we didn't oh, come yeah. home until yeah. somebody hollered for yeah. you. You know, it's dinner time, come home. Right. It's just not that way anymore. Yeah, no. um, a lot of that is because of safety and it's just, it's yeah. just a different world than yeah. what we grew up in. And so yeah. to have a place where they can run and, and, you know, be at one with nature and, you know, learn to love their environment and yeah. run and play. I mean, that, that's a big deal. And, to have something like that right here in Bastrop. Mm -hmm. I know I mentioned you on an earlier episode because I just I was looking to see what events were coming up and I ran across the website and I was so excited. I was like, I've got to call this guy, I've got to bring him in here. I want to know what they do. Um and so because there's so much fun stuff no matter like you said if you were a kid or an adult, mm -hmm. um you had bow making, yep. which I thought was like, what? <laughs> Me, I need to do that. Um, Sweet, come on Just out. a lot of really cool yeah. things that you guys do that I had no idea that was available in Bastrop. And I hope a lot of you know people in Bastrop County see this episode and know what you guys do and get involved because because I just think it's super cool. So tell us where you're located yeah. and tell them about your website um, so people can go on and you know take a look for themselves. Great. Um, so we're located... Uh, just west of Bastrop, about five miles. We're off of Shiloh Road, so if folks are familiar with Shiloh Road, just kind of south of Highway 71. Um, and uh, our address is off of Woodview Lane. But we have a website, um, earthnativeschool.com, and uh, we have tons of classes. I mean, just this spring, from now until May, we have probably 10 adult classes up on the schedule and similar number of youth classes. And we have everything, you know, from one day youth classes if people want to just come check us out we have summer camps we have the preschool we have mm -hmm. once a month once a week um we, we do a lot with homeschoolers as well so we have homeschoolers that come regularly like mm -hmm. once a week for long-term nice. programs and that's pretty amazing to have them for like 35 class days per school mm -hmm. year i bet yeah. yeah and so i saw something which i found really interesting about the the tracking so you can get some kind of certificate yeah for, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. I thought that so, was really um, cool. I, when I got into wilderness survival skills, so, you know, I grew up doing this stuff, but on a kind of a, you know, novelty level, you know, uh, watching videos and doing some basic survival stuff with search and rescue. And then I was in the military for six years. And when I got out, I was just looking for what was next in my life. You know, I didn't really have any, uh, a job or any direction in mind. And so I started taking wilderness survival and outdoor classes. And that's when I really got into wildlife tracking as well, because often wilderness survival and outdoor skills and wildlife tracking are taught at similar schools. And so I got into wildlife tracking and thinking mainly just like, well, everybody's doing this and what's this all about? And my prior experience to wildlife tracking was just for hunting. And um, 
I didn't really, you know, I, I enjoyed going out and looking at tracks, but mainly just like, oh, these are fresh deer tracks and looking for some deer. That's really cool. So I live in but, Tahitian yeah, Village yeah. and we have all kind of animals running around everywhere. Yeah. And so that would, I yeah. think I would really enjoy that just so I would have the knowledge of that. I spent a lot yeah. of time, you know, we were close to the Colorado River. I spent a lot of time, you know, down there walking around, you know, filming, uh, photographing, yeah. whatever. And I, I know I would love that. That sounds like a lot of fun. Well, yeah. one of the cool things about wildlife tracking is that there are so many animals in our area. I mean, some so many that we're not even aware of, and we don't really see them during the day. You know, you can go out and you can hike for a few hours along the river and, you know, see a few birds, um, not see a whole lot, no, hardly any mammals, maybe other than a squirrel. But um, if you get down there and you start looking at tracks, you get to really kind of unlock all the mysteries of what's going on and who's out there. And a good example of that is when I moved back to this area, I was teaching uh, at a wilderness school in, um, in Washington State. And when I moved back here, um, I was, you know, tracking kind of a new and figured out there's a ton of beavers along the Colorado River, which a lot of people don't realize there's a lot of beavers. No and idea. river otters, too. Even Texas Parks and Wildlife wasn't aware that there were river otters all the way up the Colorado River, all the way up into Austin, and, and even probably past um, Lake Travis. And so um, I still haven't seen a river otter after a decade of tracking out here, but I find their tracks all the time. That's and, interesting. Uh, just I just need to know that, that they're out there. That's cool. That's you really mentioned um, the youth, of course. As far as teenagers, yeah. with me having teenage yeah. boys, and yeah. you know, that's the first thing I thought of. So how many do you usually get in, yeah. as far as teens that come and get yeah. involved? Teens, well, we have um, we have a few teen programs that are targeted for teens. We have teen overnight summer camps, mm -hmm. which have been really popular oh, the last few okay. years. And so they come for a week and mm -hmm. they camp out with us and learn wilderness skills. And uh, it's a really good time. So we have two of those this summer. And then we also have... Um, a once a month teen program called Teen Wilderness Adventure mm -hmm. that runs during the school year one Saturday a month and that's pretty pretty awesome and then we have a program for teens that meets once a week for homeschool teens on Wednesday Thursday and Friday each three different classes okay. um, called the Red Wolves and they meet oh. um, in, in McKinney Falls State Park in Austin um, three sessions a month and then one session a month at our okay. Bastrop campus and um, for some of those kids, I mean, we've we've got one kid that kind of just graduated from that program. He's like 17, but he started with us when he was about, I think, seven or eight, and wow. um, just yeah. super competent, you know, now, and he's got yeah. so many outdoor skills, and uh, it's just really neat to see how they grow. What a great opportunity. Grow. Yeah. Nice, yeah. Well, thank you so much yeah. for coming here and sharing with us what you do. Of course, thanks do. for having we me. really appreciate you being our guest. Yes, thank absolutely. Thank you. Makes great to meet you all. Yeah, well, come now. on out. <laughs> we will. We'll have to come out there. At least we'll make that a day. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. You're invited Saturday, February 22nd to the biannual wellness fair from 12 o'clock p.m. to 6 o'clock p.m. in the lobby of the Hampton Inn and Suites in Bastrop, Texas. You won't want to miss this fair. There'll be vendors, well checks, food and prizes, something for every family member. Visit us online at www.thebcboa for more information. I'm Sarah Wingenfeld and today I'm at the Earth Native Wilderness School here in Bastrop and so we're going to learn a lot about what it's like to live in the wilderness and edible plants, things along those lines. So let's go check it out and meet our host. So I'm Sari Wingenfeld. Yeah. Thank you so much for having us Thank out here today. Having, I'm actually really excited. Um, so you teach a bunch of survival skills, correct? Like yeah, from the bare yeah. minimals to, yeah. yeah. We teach just about everything. And you know, I think that what I really appreciate is helping people to build unique and deep relationships with the outdoors. And, and so I know that when people go out into the woods, often feels like a place that's not, they're not comfortable in, or they're not, um, don't feel like they could take care of themselves if something. Well, it's like scary wrong. and kind of terrifying because yeah, it be. it's unknown to right. them. It can be. So right. as you develop more skills, you know, you start to become more comfortable. You start to learn about the different things that live out there and how you might take care of yourself. And mm -hmm. um, I think it really, it just enhances our outdoor experiences. And whether that just be seeing things that are familiar and cool and neat or, um, you know, feeling more comfortable in, in outdoor excursions and being able to take longer trips and um, it just experience it in a more rich way.
Yeah, absolutely. That sounds great. And so you're going to kind of give me a little bit of preview sure, and yeah. a little blip of some of your programs that you yeah. have, right? And show me some basic neat things. So if I get lost, maybe I can identify <laughs> some edible foods or... <laughs> sure. Yeah, we could definitely do that. We'd probably need more, a little bit more time to get you really good, but we'll do our best. <laughs> Maybe if I could at least like somewhat identify. That's not right. a good mushroom. Yeah. Probably in the Stay relevant away from of the mushrooms. That's a good tip. <laughs> Just all the all around. All around. Stay away from the mushrooms. Just because mush there's some mushrooms out there that will kill you. Yes. And um, there's a very few like green leafy plants that will kill you. So um, oh. mushrooms and and some mushrooms have look likes. And so there's generally. Mushrooms, I recommend people stay away from things in the carrot family. If it looks like the top of a carrot, don't don't eat it. Oh, um, I'm really glad that you said that because yeah. actually on my property, yeah. I have a couple of things yeah. where I'm like, this almost looks like a beet or yeah. like a white yeah. carrot type thing. Yeah, those, um, well, there good. are species in that category, water hemlock and poison hemlock that are in that family that will kill you just pretty quickly and nothing that anybody can do to save you. Oh. So, but, but you know, the, the truth is, is that there's very few plants in our area that are extremely toxic you know there's like maybe five and um, a lot of them are common plants that we're not even aware of like oleander is one mountain laurel if you were to crack the seeds open of a mountain laurel those can actually kill pets as well oh. um, but if you just learn about the five or six plants you know that are pretty toxic then there's hundreds and hundreds thousands of plants actually that you can mess around with and and check out so you know that's some of the things we teach at the school is is you know learning good identification but also not being scared to explore you know hundreds of edible species just because there are a couple things that you could learn to identify that you could stay away from that are not that common anyway either right right so it's kind of easier to like identify the big no-nos and yeah, stay away from right. those and then yeah you can kind of branch out to other things and though they may not taste great they're not going to actually be harmful for you true and there are there's so many safe plants out there that don't look anything like any of the ones that are toxic and so um you know i i recommend since it's kind of overwhelming when it comes to plants that people just learn about um, them just one at a time, you know, because you can sure. just be like, there's thousands of plants. How would I ever learn one? But there's just a few that um, you can just start to learn really easily. In fact, I had a plant teacher way back in the day that was just a master. She would go out and make entire feasts out of just wild things that she'd harvested. Love and she it. She recommended that, you know, if people are really interested in learning about wild edible plants, just, in, you know, even in their yard, I mean, there's probably 20 to 30 edible plant species in most people's yard, mm -hmm. um, that you just pick up one plant a week. And if you were to just pick one plant a week and identify it and look it up in the book and go out and eat it and maybe cook it up, then you'd know 52 plants and you'd have eaten 52 plants in a year. And I was like, okay, that's a cool idea to like kind of take yeah. them in small bites, you know? No that's true. Intended. So I have actually, or pun intended, <laughs> puns are punny. Sure. I'm a pun fan. Um, so I have books to try and help me yeah. identify plants and things along those lines. But I feel like it's really difficult because when you're looking at a yeah. drawing and it's this totally. big and I mean, it's completely different than actually being in the field yeah. with somebody who's yeah. knowledgeable, you almost right. kind of have to find someone that you can apprentice, yeah. if you will, under to learn the the edible world that that we are literally surrounds us yeah. right good thing there's a school in bastrop county that's just perfect for that <laughs> yeah i agree where is it <laughs> right <here. laughs> it's um, at our fingertips yeah. i love this <laughs> so no, i agree with you i really this is secret i've never told anyone anyway, i hate looking in plant field guides i find the same problems that you do i've learned all my plant knowledge through people passing it on to me, you know, other teachers yeah. or, um, I feel know, like it's yeah. just, it's necessary. Yeah. It's so necessary. And, and a lot of times what's neat is when we get these plant classes, you know, we have an expert plant instructor that will teach people about the plants, but there's often a lot of other people in the class too, that know a lot. And then they can add in information as well and be like, Oh, did you know this is that, or you can make tea out of this. And we're like, Oh, cool. So we're always learning at the same right. time. Right. Or, and yeah. like health benefits too. Yeah. So, I mean, it like, pine needle tea is yeah. really great for your eyesight and things yeah. along those lines. And though you may know, oh, you can make tea out of pine needles, yeah. uh, you know, someone might say, hey, but did you know that that's actually a benefit yeah. for your eyesight as well you know or things along those lines? crazy is things like pine needles have a ton of vitamin C in right. them. Right, yep. And um, people, you know, when they were settling and coming out on the wagon trains out west were dying by the you know, thousands of scurvy from, you know, vitamin C deficiency just feet away from pine and hemlock and, spruce Rob, and all yeah, those trees yeah. where they could have just made tea from it and they would have been fine. Right. So, you know, yeah, medicinal plants can definitely help us. And I mean, most most modern medicines are actually originally plant-based and yep. then they get 
you know, turned into modern medicine. So it's really neat to learn cool salves and tinctures and teas. And, um, and we do offer medicinal and edible plant classes. And we even teach people how to prepare different medicinal plants. Um, yeah, so that's a cool, those are cool, really cool topics that are really popular. Yeah, yeah, I bet. And then also just basic survival skills. So like yeah. you were saying, um, how to make a fire yeah. and fun things like that. So we're going to make a fire, right? Yeah, Did you want to go ahead fire. and do it? Okay. So, um, I'll, I'll walk you around and, and show you some of the things that I might gather um, okay. to make a fire off the land. One of the, th one of the exercises that I really like more than anything is to teach people how to make a fire with nothing but the materials that they can gather themselves with their hands off the landscape. And, um, you know, no paper or modern fuels or anything like right, that. So, right. Yeah. So I can't go get grab the gas can and <laughs> no, get a little don't, diesel don't, and diesel barely gas. <laughs> yeah, no. that Just kidding. Um, yeah. <laughs> um okay, yeah, sounds good. Um cool. let's definitely do it. Great. So we want to get it real, real fine so it can catch fire real right. easy, right? And so this is our nest? Yeah. Okay, and so I'm trying to remember. This is the spindle, right? Yes. And then this is the socket? Yes. And what is this again? The board. The fire board? Yeah. It's just a fire board, right? There's no special fire name. Board. And then, of yep. course, this is the bow. Yeah. You got it upside right. down. I do. Okay. There you go. Um, you're going to want to move away. If you want to do it, you want to move over. Probably away from all this stuff so you're not... Oh, right. Anyway. Let's not start a fire before we want to start the fire. Gotcha. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. So. Do it this that way. way. That way. Um, you want your spindle to be on the outside of the string. It's been a long time, sir. <laughs> Put your foot on here. Yeah. Okay. Put it right next to the hole. Right next to the hole. Yeah. Okay. There you go. And move it forward a little bit. There you go. All right. Oh. This thing is going to fall and bug me. All right. Hold it all the way back there right where the string comes off. Okay. There you go. Lock, you want to lock your wrist into your shin. So move your foot a little bit more forward. You want it to be really stable, so you want to put your wrist right there. There you go. Okay. Just start with slow little choppy back and forth. It's been a hot minute. <laughs> Oh, it's so choppy. Why can't I go one way? You're go. pushing it, like binding it. So push it back a little bit. There you go. Oh, okay. Nice. I'll start smoking in a sec. Is it there? No. Not quite? <laughs> you gotta go a little faster. Okay. <laughs> oh, crap. Oh, yeah. Looks like you have it. Let's see. Yep. You got it. No way. You did it. All right. Let's not let the wind blow it. So here, put that down right there. Let's just transfer this very carefully into it. Oh, you see it? Yes, yeah. Look at my beautiful coal. Look at my beautiful coal. <laughs> That's awesome. Good work. Good work. Okay. Now you want to wrap this up in here like this. Hold it with your fingertips and just blow right into that. Give it kind of some pressure so that it holds it in there. Good, good. You can blow a little harder now. There it goes. All right. So put it in the pit? Put it in and we'll put some sticks on it.
Great. <clears throat> All right, so when we start a fire, we want to start with really little sticks. We don't really need this small if we're not doing it with a match. If we were doing it with a match, generally I tell people that you want to um, you want to light nothing larger than the match stick itself. So you want a bunch of like match stick or smaller size, but we can actually start with this next size up, which is kind of pencil size. Okay. And um, even though this is not flaming anymore, there's still a good base, so we can put this on top, and then you can just go ahead and blow on that now again. So just blow right in there, and it'll light back up again. Keep going. If you can blow where you can see it glowing red, then that's ideal. Your breath is skipping over it. Give it, I think, one or two more good breaths and it'll go. There it goes. And then we can just, so we start, you need to give it one more. Yeah, that's the sound we want to hear. Great. So um, we might need to blow on that again, but we can start with like pencil size. The wind might even do the work for us. Then we can put on slightly bigger than pencil size. And just kind of work our way up. Everything in, with fire is better when it's gradual. Right. You know that when you go to the store, the worst kind of scenario is you go to the store and you get those logs, you know, and then you got to try and light oak log with a match. Um, and that's not really going to happen. The longer the breath you can give, the better. So if you go like a real, take a deep breath and blow it out real slowly over a long period of time. That's the one that'll do it. Now it's gonna go on its own. Awesome work, good job. Yay, thank you, <laughs> <laughs> boom. So today we have Cherry K. Abel with us from Visit Bastrop. Thank you for being with us today, Cherry. Thank you. And if you could tell us a little bit, because you're new to Visit Bastrop, correct? Yes. And could you tell us a little bit about you and how long you've been with Visit Bastrop? Sure. Um, I've been with Visit Bastrop three weeks today. Um, I had came from a association field and I had been in Austin uh, for uh, 15, past 15 years. So the past seven years, I was uh, the CEO of an association. And so I'm very familiar with the yeah. association and the meetings. And um, I built my home out here about four years ago. Nice. So I was very excited when this yeah. position came open. So I wouldn't have to drive down 71 every day right. to commute. <laughs> and um, so I'm real excited about the team. Uh, what we're doing at Visit Bastrop and um, all hopefully I can use all my experience mm -hmm. from the past uh, that can really promote uh, this city. So it sounds like you do have a lot of experience to bring to Visit Bastrop. I think so yeah. but um, I'm always up for a challenge right. and um, just very excited um, to be able to um, have this as a destination for Bastrop and for the meetings and the convention industry and uh, groups and tourism. Very excited about all this. Wonderful. Um, I know most of our viewers know this, but I'm also the general manager of the, the Hampton by Hilton, mm -hmm. which is here in Bastrop. Mm -hmm. And I work really closely with Visit Bastrop. Um, uh, since I've been there the last year, I've worked really closely with Catherine Lang. And I know yes. Catherine um, works with you now. Mm -hmm. And um, I just want to say she's Catherine's done an amazing job, um, you know, helping us out at the hotel. And I know, you know, she's excited to be working with you. And you guys are, you know, doing a little bit of different things and, you know, focusing on, um, you know, bringing in groups. And, you know, they also, when I have groups come in, um, they help us out by giving them gift bags and, you know, trying to push them, those visitors out into the community, mm -hmm. which makes an economic impact, you know, on our community. So for a lot of our viewers who don't understand what Visit Bastrop's role is in the community and, and what they do, I know that you kind of, kind of like the old CVBs, you, the Convention and Visitors Bureau, that you guys function like that. 
Um, and there is one for, you know, we've had, you know, Fran Hunter on earlier, um, our, one of our earlier episodes, and Fran and um, Adina Lewis work with um, Visit Bastrop County, but you specifically work with Visit Bastrop. So can you kind of tell our viewers a little bit about what you do uh, as far as not you, you personally as well, but you as a Visit Bastrop do for the community? Sure. Um, so Visit Bastrop is a DMO, and we are, um, and we, we're set aside, so we're not a part of the city. And we um, are funded by hot fund, by, excuse me, by um, Occ hotel, occupancy, uh, hotel yeah. occupancy tax. And um, so what Visit Bastrop does, it brings, we need to bring groups and, me and group meetings, uh, conferences, conventions to Bastrop. And we're going to bring tourism here. And we want to uh, work collaboratively with the uh, businesses and the hoteliers. Mm -hmm. And that way we can, Bastrop can be a destination. And that way people, when they want to have their, you know, leadership uh, conference or they want to have your annual conference or they want to have their spring board meeting, mm -hmm. they will come to Bastrop. And all the revenue will be awesome for the city of Bastrop. Absolutely. And I, I can attest to that firsthand with the Opera House because Visit Bastrop has been working with us to bring in the Texas Nonprofit Theaters conference yes. youth conference this summer in fact they're going to be here for the next two years and that'll right. bring in about 500 um, young people yes. uh, second week of june i think we're already going to be filling up the hotels and it's, it's going to be an amazing experience for these kids that are coming all from all over texas absolutely um mm -hmm. i know that we have uh, blocked a bunch of rooms at our hotel at the, at the hampton mm -hmm. for that event exactly. so so just so viewers know when you're looking for hotel rooms um, because you know these big groups that you're bringing in from outside, you send out what we call mm -hmm. an RFP mm -hmm. and requesting that the local hoteliers tell you how many rooms yes. are available so you can go back to the person and say, look, you know, the um, Holiday Inn Express has this many rooms available, the mm -hmm. Hampton has this many, the Hyatt has this many, and, you know, so forth and so on. Um, I know a lot of people don't kind of understand but, uh, how that works, but I want to say again about hotel occupancy tax. That is not something that we as residents right. of the county pay at all. It doesn't right. come out of our pocket. It's only people that are coming in as guests. There's an extra tax that they pay, and it's 13.5 now or 13.75%. Mm -hmm. So they pay that when they come in to visit our county, when they stay at one of our hotels, bed and breakfast, mm -hmm. you know, that sort of thing. And then we as a city and through Visit Bastrop use those funds to bring in more business, which of course, you know, is an economic impact mm -hmm. on the community. Yeah. So, Definitely. yeah. It's, um, I've been so amazed the last three weeks that uh, I have groups that want to come here that I have uh, sent out and, you know, requested for the proposals. And they're like, um, we don't, I don't have any room in my hotels. So right. that's, that's exciting, but challenging. <laughs> so I'm up for the challenge. But I'm real. I'm really excited that I can work with the businesses to let them understand that this is going to bring them revenue. It, right. This is all. It's going to bring the city revenue, and in addition to that, the hoteliers. It's just going to bring them more business, and then we'll have repeat business. Uh, when I was the association director, I would uh, book my contracts for like two to three years, mm -hmm. like your mm -hmm. company that your organization did. So I'm real excited about that. I want people to have a, a wonderful experience. It's all about experiences. And Absolutely. so when they come here, they can, you know, have fun uh, riding horses at Hyatt or coming down here mm -hmm. to Main Street right. and our neighbors, you know, on the river and they can have all this fun and then remember these things. And, um, you know, that's what, that's what it's all, that's what it's all about. And giving them uh, good food right. and memories. Yeah. yeah. And an experience that, yeah. you know, they'll want to come back again right. next year. It's like, oh, we got to come back. So, um, there's a group called Corvette Invasion, which hopefully you guys are all familiar with. And, um, that's an event that we work through the hotel to bring into the city, um, and, Visit, visit Bastrop um, is working with them, so they're coming back next year. Oh, and Visit Bastrop's wor um, working with them and to create this this whole broad experience for these uh -huh. people that come in. Mm -hmm. And um, the weekend of the twentieth, we have a group called Corvette Corral that Sean Jones, who is um, 
the head of, of uh, Corvette Invasion, um, uh, Sweet Rides. Um, Sean and I brought this big group in um, for the Le Mans race, which is coming up that weekend. And I reached out um, to visit Bastrop and said, you know, hey, I, you know, all these people are coming in. Let's do some bags for them mm -hmm. so that, that while they're here, they'll eat at our local restaurants. Right. They'll shop at our local places, you know, mm -hmm. things that we can. And that's a, um, a lot of local business owners don't know. Like, they can contact you, right, and say, yes. we're interested in working with you. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we want to get you pamphlets or information or whatever it is and you even have a website which i use quite frequently i do too um mm -hmm. we talked yeah. about this earlier where we can upload our own events on your website yes. so visitors can mm -hmm. see can yes. you tell them about that yeah yes um well visit bastrop.com <clears throat> has uh, we have an amazing marketing team i know that mm -hmm. a lot of people are familiar with with uh, ashton and her mm -hmm. team um you there's just everything you need to know about bastrop things to do, places to go, places to eat, and hotels to stay at. So, I mean, it's just, and our website is just growing and getting more involved, and, and we're, we're changing it up and adding things to it. Um, our newest um, adventure is uh, working with the, the businesses, and what we want to do is, like when our meeting uh, individuals come in, we want them to show that they can go visit these these businesses and get maybe discounts on food or discounts mm -hmm. on clothing. Right. So we're talking about uh, maybe clings for the windows and or maybe a little um, a little laminated card that the uh, meeting meeting uh, meeting uh, patron will get when in their bag That's, when they get here. That's great. Yeah. So yeah. we're coming up with a lot of things and we're working. We want to work really closely with the community for events and um, group tours so we really are branching out and trying to be really strategic but work with the city and you know work with the patrons so that's Great. our goals nice. well i know speaking of ash an amazing person by the mm -hmm. way who does yes. an incredible job um i love the map so she made yes. this perfect map that shows the downtown and and the little areas and, and i know mm -hmm. that um the veterans day car show everybody had those maps they were like this is amazing we can you know we know where we're going we know where everything is so so make no mistake visit bastrop works really hard yeah. on you know on your behalf whether you know it or not mm -hmm. you know just just right. that simple so yeah, yeah we're, we're real excited and you know i know the music festival is coming up soon yes. and may 15th of yeah. the weekend and we're excited about that event and we're going to be promoting that like 30 plus uh, bands 40 plus performances so uh, it's just going to be great and keep ha coming you know people coming back to bastrop absolutely. You know? absolutely now is this the the second annual music no. festival is this the i think it's the third yeah third or fourth yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah and and that's going to be a crazy exciting weekend yeah. because we also have the superhero supervillain yes. fun run and yes. obstacle course yes. Um, which the BCBOA, yeah. the Bastrop County Business yeah. Owners Association, is putting on down uh, in the park. So we're going to have all these bands across the town. That's going to be a heavy tourism weekend. Yeah. We're all really excited about that. I know the music festival's great. And so, you know, that's not just for visitors, but for locals as well. Mm -hmm. Be sure that, that you, you know, participate in that because, wow, these events are, are great that we can bring to the community and... Um, you know, have all these great things where you don't have to go out of town to to do all these cool things. Right. They're right here in right Bastrop County. Yeah. yeah, absolutely, exactly. absolutely. And I know um, that we all have a vested interest in Bastrop doing well, but not just for our own benefit, but for everyone. You know what I mm -hmm. mean? And and right. you know, we want to see things you know succeed in this. I tell you, we're growing like crazy yes it just in the two years that i've been here it's amazing and i talked the other day to a builder um who's building 800 new homes behind my hampton inn oh my. 800 new homes wow. you know they're putting that road through to 304 right. uh -huh. so it's just the community is growing and growing and growing and 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 visit bastrop is obviously growing with the community 
So, yeah, we really do appreciate you coming on and you talking about this. And, you know, I want to take this opportunity to welcome you. Uh, Even though you're not new to the (laughs) community, you're new to the job. And and we do do appreciate what you guys do so much. Well, it's going to be fun and exciting. And I'm excited about the engagement with the town and the city of... I've already attended so many meetings and Great. and so I'm real excited what this yes. uh, what, what visit Bastrop's uh, doing and where we're going. Wonderful, so, wonderful, it's exciting thank times. You. Yeah, it is. It is. Well, thank you again for being our guest. Thank you. So, Lisa, what a great show. Really interesting guest today. It really was. I enjoyed hearing from both of the guests and learning about both of their 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 different businesses. They were so so different. Right. They have yeah. big contrast yes. with today's uh-huh. show. So, TJ, I know that you've got a list of things that are coming up in the community this coming week that sound really fun and interesting. Can you tell us a little bit about them? Absolutely. So on February 19th, Neighbors Kitchen and Yard is having a plant night from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. It's for ages 13 and up. So you get to design your own succulent planter. So that's something that's really different. yeah. Yeah, that sounds like a lot of fun. And then on February 20th, the Elgin's Farmer Market is from 5 to 8 p.m. So apparently that's going to be every Thursday from now on until October 29th. Oh, great. So that's really interesting. Um, February 21st, they're doing the Bags, Bobbles, and Bubbly Designer Purse Mm. Bingo um, at the Bastrop Convention Center, which, you know, sounds like something fun for us to do. I'd love to go win a purse, so that that sounds fun. Mm -hmm. And the best thing about it, it, and the proceeds are going to go to um, to victims of child abuse in the county. So mm-hmm. that, you know, you're going to go have a great night of fun at the Bastrop Convention mm-hmm. Center. And then knowing that whatever money you spend is going to go to a good cause. Right. So that's, that's always fabulous. wonderful. Yes. And so on February 22nd, there's a mindfulness in nature half day retreat in Smithville at the Bastrop mm-hmm. State Park. Okay. So that sounds like something really interesting. Um So you get to learn and explore and, you know, explore nature and that sort of things. Right. And there's no charge. You only pay your entry fee to get into the park. So that's a great thing for families to do together. Um, And then on February 23rd, excited about this next one. Their Copper Shot is doing their first chili challenge. Yay! Uh, At 2 o'clock at um, Copper Shot Distillery, which is, you know, just here at 809 Main Street. Uh So I'm I'm happy to come judge and taste everything in case they need someone for that. (laughs) So that sounds really exciting. I know it's just... um, um, Entry fee is like $25, and Mm -hmm. I think it's $10... um, um, for the judges, and then it's free to attend. Oh, So great. that would be yeah. something really fun yeah. to get out and do, so I'm yeah. really, really yeah. excited about that. That's great. So there's some great events that you guys can get involved uh-huh. in in the community. Yeah. Now, TJ, um, I've had a lot of fun co-hosting today, and I know that Mayor Connie will be back next week. She will. Who are your guests for next week? Absolutely. So next week we have Trisha Silver with the Bass Rock Food Pantry. Okay. And she's going to come on and tell us about the Empty Bowl Project. Oh, so this yeah. is an annual Great. event that they do, and we're really thrilled that um, Trisha's going to come on and tell us about that. And then we have Sherry Hyatt with Rogue Prosthetics. So okay. they're a local company that have been in here at Bass Rock for a long time. And some people are not aware of them. And, and we thought it would be great for Sherry to come mm-hmm. on, tell us um, a little bit about Rogue, and tell us about an exciting event. I don't want to spoil it, but an exciting yeah. event that they have coming up. So um, that's who we're going to have on with us next week. Fantastic. Great. Yeah, we're looking forward to it. And also, um, just to, to let our viewers know, um, we are looking for sponsors for the show. So if that's something that you would be interested in doing, um, please send us an email at heartofbastrop.com or you can um, email us through our website at theheartofbastrop.com. Thank you so much for watching and thank you so much 
for coming and co-hosting today with me. Oh, and hopefully pleasure. you'll be able to do that sometime again in the future when Absolutely. Mayor Connie um, is not able to attend. So we really do appreciate that. Thank you all for watching and have a great week. This episode was sponsored by the Bastrop County Business Owners Association. Join us for the Wellness Fair on Saturday, February 22nd from 12 to 6 p.m. at the Hampton Inn and Suites in Bastrop, Texas. For more information, go to our website, thebcboa.com.